Shalom to our viewers. Shalom to Rav Menachem. Shalom Rav Menachem. And Shalom and welcome to the Machon Meir Parsha Talks. But this time we're not going to be talking about the Parsha. We have a day of commemoration coming up in front of us, the 9th of Av Tisha B'Av. We're going to be mourning about the destruction of the Temple. Unless we have some good news really quick. I'm hoping then, uh... he can arrive any minute now and we're hoping and waiting. But if there are some traffic jams on the way and he tarries, He'll come the next day and we're waiting for him. But until then, if we're going to commemorate the 9th of Av with this great fast of some 24, 25 hours, what are we supposed to be thinking about? What are we really lacking? What's missing? From my point of view, I've never experienced seeing or, or, or being inside the Holy Temple, the Beit HaMikdash. So many, many of us really don't know what it is. Right. We try to imagine it. There's the Temple Institute where you can actually uh, see a virtual reality uh, experience going towards the Temple and uh, trying to sacrifice. But uh, we all know that that was the center, the center of, uh, of, of the world, according to our tradition. That's where God's presence uh, uh, is always, remains. Um, His highest level of presence is in that His level of presence is focused on the Temple Mount where Avram took Yitzchak to the Akedah, and then later on the temple, both temples were built in history. So it's really definitely uh, a place of the, which is the cen center, it's the center, the, both the, the, it was the center of the, uh, the Jewish nation, the, Jewish, the capital of the kingdom of David and, and uh, Solomon. But of course, uh, uh, we stress that it's the capital of, of Jewish spirituality. In other words, we have the holiest nation, the Jewish people. Hmm. In the holiest place, the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, and the nation led by their priests, their Kohenim, the, the, the tribe of Levi, uh, working in the area of the Holy Temple and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing according to divine ordinance. So it's a it's, it's, it's metaphysical meeting of the nation in this particular area, doing whatever they're supposed to be doing in morning, afternoon, or at night. What comes out of that? What, what, what is being projected by the Jewish people? We read ki, and we sing Ki Mitzion Te Torah that ultimately this, this light or this intense focused light which perhaps is coming down from the sky and you can see that the rays of, you know, it's a metaphor, but the rays of spirituality are focused on this one mount, mountain, this, this unique place. Ultimately it's supposed to be refracted out to the rest of the world that this spirituality should, should be spread and uh, First and foremost everywhere. to the nation of Israel. For when, sure, when concentric have, circles. In other words, the nation of Israel is being built and they're developed and there's this spiritual health when we have the Holy Temple and we're doing exactly what we're doing. And then it can spread outwards, as you're saying, further to the nations of the world. I once heard an analogy. And Rav Bigon, the head of Machon Rosh Hashiv, Machon Mir, would make the, this following analogy that the Holy Temple is anal analogous to this gigantic power plant. Mm -hmm. And this power plant provides, let's say, electricity for this city who have millions and millions of people. And when the power plant is working, there's light, there's electricity. Mm -hmm. Air conditioners are working, all electrical facilities are working, and they're having this terrific, fantastic electricity and power. Whereas when the Jewish people have their temple and we're doing what we're, what we're supposed to be doing, we have this spiritual light on us that's bringing goodness to the world, tov to the world. Right, right. It's similar to what uh, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi describes in the Kuzari, and he describes Jerusalem as being the heart of, of the Jewish nation, just like, um, you know, the, the human body has many, we have arms and legs and uh, different vital organs, but the heart is seen to be the center, and from there the blood goes out to all the other uh, extremities, and um, this beating heart at the at the heart of the nation of Israel is what Jerusalem is, that this is a center which uh, is supposed to give life, give life and Torah to, to the Jewish people and ultimately to the entire nation, we say in our prayers. Um, that this uh, house, this house of God, will be a house of prayer not only for the Jewish people, but also for the entire world, for the entire nations. As uh, King Solomon spoke about when he inaugurated the first temple in his um, in his long and beautiful prayer, how this temple will be, um, by the hand of God, the center of prayer for all the nations, wherever they may be, whenever ha anybody has a problem, whether it's drought or uh, enemies or uh, difficulties of, uh, of any kind, the, all the prayers in the world 
they come sort of, they're funneled into uh, through the Beit HaMikdash, through the Temple in Jerusalem. And we're missing all that today. Uh, this is something for us to think about on the Tisha B'Av. And about talking about this funnel, when we have the Temple, and of course, no one is perfect. We have our failings, we have our mistakes that we make. We'd be able to approach the Temple after whatever failure or mistake or sin, transgression that I did, and through these koanim, through this agency, this divine institution called the priesthood, these korbanot, from the word kor karov, closeness. At the time that I was doing the sin, I felt, or I felt this distance. And now through this holy sacrifice, this korban, there's this inner cleansing. Whatever stain that I've caused inside my soul, it's being wiped away, this kapara. This atonement, cleansing, atonement, atonement, which we say, which yeah, we say kapara, as you've explained beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's the removal, as Rashi explains in one of the books, the removal of whatever there was there, a spiritual removal to say. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, until that time, we, we try through prayers and through good deeds and tshuva to always improve ourselves and uh, we pray to God that He will forgive us. I want to just mention that there's a strange, unique uh, aspect. You know, w at every wedding, where we're so happy and we're celebrating, we break a glass to commemorate the, the tragedy. And sometimes people joke that, you know, if you're a Jew, you can't 100% ever be happy because there's always something, there's always some either guilt or there's some kind of, uh, of um, sa sadness which is touching you. On Tisha B'Av, we find the exact opposite. It's very interesting. Of course, it's primarily it's a day of mourning. We're sitting on the floor and we're thinking about all the tragedies which, which uh, came over the Jewish people throughout history. But there is an element of festivity to it. It's very interesting. On Tisha B'Av, um, in the prayer services every day, we have a section called Tachanun, which is called supplications after the Amidah prayer, after our, our personal uh, uh, talk with God. We have a section which is only said on days that don't have anything festive about them. Very interestingly, on Tisha B'Av, on this fast day, we don't say the Tachanun prayer. Tachanun prayer is not said on festivals. It's very interesting. In the book of Eicha, the book of Lamentations, which we read on, on the, the ninth of Av, it calls this day of commemoration Kara Alai Moed. It's called the Moed. A moed is a an appointed time, an appointed certain time, specific, time. specific time. Of closeness to God, of course. Absolutely. But it also means festival. There's something festive about Tisha B'Av. Um, there's even some customs which uh, are hard to understand. I, would, I mentioned that we sit on the floor on the ninth of Av or on a low stool. After Chatzot, after the half day comes, we're allowed to sit on chairs. We're already some of less the, morning. Some yeah, some of the customs of morning, they, of morning. They, they decrease and they uh, they loosen up a little bit. And there's even um, customs brought down in the the books that. Some people clean their houses. They sweep the floors or, or wash uh, dishes. Uh, yeah, they get they prepare get, the they house. Get it ready for what? What are they preparing for? So there's an element of hope, hope for the future. We're not only just mourning for the past and wallowing in either our guilt or in our our sorrow, but we're actually hopeful for the future and. As uh, Napoleon once said, the legend goes that he walked into a synagogue on the 9th of Av and he saw people sitting on the floor and they're mourning. For what? And I said, what, what is this? They said, oh, there's a temple that was destroyed so many thousands of years ago. And he said, a nation that knows how to mourn for their past, for their history, and is still keeping that memory alive, they have hope for the future. And so through this mourning process, we're actually trying to turn it around and have hope that perhaps Mashiach will come, the, the redemption will come closer on that very self-same day. And we can look, let's just look outside. We're in Jerusalem. The land of Israel is being built. Look at all the infrastructure and technology and agriculture and industry, how the land of Israel in general, and Jerusalem in particular, is being built up. More, more housing, more synagogues, more schools of learning, more mikvaot. On the one hand, when we go and mourn, and we can actually, we have the merit to be able to mourn near the Kotel, near the Temple Mount, near the place, and you can actually see the stone 
thrown down from the top of the hill down to the bottom um, when uh, they destroyed the, the Beit HaMikdash, when Titus uh, destroyed everything that was on this beautiful uh, edifice which uh, Herod had built in the enlarged Temple Mount. We can see it today with our eyes. So of course, it, it brings the morning home and much closer. But on the other hand, the walk, the travel, the way to get there, you see all around you, Jerusalem is being built all around. We haven't reached the, the culmination. The, we have a lot of consolation already. Yeah. The, the wheels have begun, and we can just hope and pray right. that those days are going to get sooner and sooner, that we're right. going to see other levels of building. As, as the Prophet promises, is that uh, the fast days that we have, what is the Pasuk Tzomar of the Right. Zechariah says the, the fast of the fourth, fourth month, and the fast of the fifth month, Tisha, the month of Av, and the seventh month of Tzom Gedalia and Tishrei, and the tenth month of Tevet, which are all consolidating together, fasting and night eating and drinking, so we remember the destruction of the Temple. All those days are going to turn into days of rejoicing and happiness. You, the Beit Yehuda, the house of house of Judah, jo rejoicing and happiness, and great festival days. So this this day of mourning <clears throat> will turn into, and all the four four days of mourning mentioned have the potential to turn into days of celebration. And perhaps that we have a little bit of festivity there on Tisha B'Av. Hopefully we'll have a lot of festivity God willing. more and more Amen. soon in our times. And of course, we welcome our viewers to join us. Join us here in Jerusalem in the land of Israel and see all this beautiful construction and building the days of redemption have begun. And we wish the Jewish people only good times. Amen. 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 In a sense, every Jew that comes, everybody that helps us rebuild Jerusalem is part of the process of rebuilding the, the uh, ruins of Jerusalem. The ruins of Jerusalem, which ultimately uh, will lead to the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi Nachim. Okay, thank, thank you to you. our Shabbat viewers. Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom to you.